you know, I noticed when the Prime Minister was introducing you to the Sabarmati Ashram image, which is at the back, you say, oh, I've been there, you know, so the moment that happens, you get this sense, okay, here's one of our own who's now risen uh, to the position of the World Bank chief, and we've been wanting to do this interview for a while, so we're very uh, thankful that you could finally take out time. I'm glad to be here. In fact, I have been to Sabarmati back in the days of being in IIM, so it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, you I actually went back there. only once after that, but uh, I love going there. I want to start by asking you about your mission to reform the World Bank. So we'll come to the Delhi Declaration in the uh -huh. G20. Do you want to give our viewers at the outset, you know, what you've set out as your mission objectives, given the World Bank's original priorities in terms of poverty alleviation to try and bringing it in to dealing with climate finance, to dealing with uh, food security and the various issues which are very here and now at this moment? So, you know, my view got informed a great deal by the three months between being a nominee and actually getting elected. In those three months, I got a chance to meet 93 different countries, uh, the leaders or the finance ministers who I was able to be in touch with. And I met civil society and I met a number of private sector companies, asset managers and the like. And that gave me a really good perspective. And I'm going to give you a distilled version of how that led to what I'm thinking. The first thing I learned was that the idea of somehow segregating you know, fighting poverty and shared prosperity on the one hand, separating it from climate or pandemics or fragility and refugees or food insecurity or biodiversity, these things don't make any sense uh -huh. because, in fact, these are intertwined crises. And when you grow up like we've done in India, you realize very quickly that if you don't have enough rainfall, you don't have two crops, then you don't have the cattle because you can't afford them, you lose your dairy income, then you lose the farm labor and you bring your child back from school to work with you. When you do that, this gain you made in poverty over decades of getting the girl child in particular to go to school gets reversed over the course of a few years of lack of rainfall. So that was one big deep comprehension. The second one was that uh, people feel nervous about what climate change means. Mm -hmm. So when the Western world speaks about climate, they're speaking mostly about the emissions-heavy growth of the past. When the developing world speaks about climate, yes, that's interesting because it's important, but it's also about soil degradation, biodiversity, lack of rainfall, heat-resistant varieties of seeds, uh, catastrophes like hurricanes and floods. and you know, So it's almost a different lexicon. And you have to be careful because one and the other are both required. What you cannot tell the developing world is that I'm going to focus on climate change, whichever of the two types, at the cost of giving you a school for girls or a health center. So that's the second big thing. Careful about not recognizing the trade-offs mm -hmm. that need to be made. And when you put this together, what we're trying to do is to do three things in the evolution roadmap of the bank, prompted by the G20 before I came in. And the first is get a new vision and mission. So the vision is going to go from just poverty and prosperity to say, you want to create a world free of poverty on a livable planet. That livable planet allows us to widen the aperture through which we look at the world to include climate, to include pandemics, to include you know, fragility and food insecurity. So you can dedicate your resources to the intertwined nature of these challenges. The second thing we've done is to make it inclusive. And what do I mean by inclusive? Everybody has spoken about inclusion to include marginalized people. I think that's really important. But let's just remember that half the world's population, females, women, are still not able to access the same opportunities that a man does, whether it is in labor force participation rates, or it is in their income for the same work done, or it is in social development and social status. And by the way, this is true of the developed world, as it is true in the developing world. So, so I'm focusing on women and young people because young people are the energy of the developing world and we've got to give them you know, quality of life and a job. So that's kind of the first big thing we're driving. So while you've studied finance and economics, you're not a classical macro global economist in the traditional way. No, right? no, no, you're, I'm far from it. You're a corporate executive, hotshot, high-flying corporate executive. I don't know about all that. Now brought in to run the World Bank. Uh, some think it's, many think it's an advantage, obviously President Biden thought it's an advantage and some would say how are you going to make the transition from uh, running MasterCard to actually running the World Bank? Like how are you making this transition 
uh, in terms of what you're trying to get done. Now, it's, look, some things are very common. Clarity of vision, simplicity of speaking to it, repeating it many times to everybody so they all get it and go to walk with you together. Uh, processes of management, measure what you want to work on, have simple scorecards, not 158 items, but a few. These are things I'm doing at the bank that aren't unique to either the private sector or the World Bank. I think I was lucky in my years in corporate life in Citibank and MasterCard. I got involved with financial inclusion. I got involved with the U.S.-India business relationship. I got involved with a cyber commission for President Obama. I worked on trade policy. So there's a little bit of me that has a little bit of exposure to this other world other than the private sector. But you know what? It's still a big challenge. And the good news is the bank has amazing people. So when you walk into the bank and you sit with people and you spend just 10 minutes asking them about their background, you will get the most amazing stories of people, how they grew up and how they've reached where they have, and their unbelievable level of education and knowledge. You harness that and you put it in the correct direction, and I think the bank is still a very important instrument of change and development. So this Delhi Declaration has a direct reference to the World Bank, and it talks about reforming the uh, more than MDB. one day more yeah, than sure. one day and yeah. making this a better bank so do you want to talk a bit about how this g20 was for you because you know apart from working on sustainable development goals reforming multilateral development banks has really been one of the key thrusts of india's uh, g20 presidency so how do you hope to deliver on that so i think this whole reform of mdbs has been part of the g20 evolution framework and india really took it on and said let's get something done during our year and uh, my view has been that for a guy who's new to the institution, who sees the need for change, this is like getting wind in your sails mm -hmm. because you get people contributing their thinking. You have to be careful to listen to everyone, then prioritize what you want to pick on and focus on that. And, you know, my focus has been to get to the better bank. And the better bank idea is get the vision and mission right, which we were talking to, then get the right partnerships going for this bank with other MDBs. So... I just announced a partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank, focusing on the Amazon, the Caribbean climate situation, and digitized governance. And then, you know, the private sector and its partnerships, we've announced the private sector lab, and actually Chandra of Tata is one of the guys who's volunteered his time to be a part of it. That's to help get more private sector money into renewable energy in the developing market. So kind of better partners. And then the third part of being a better bank is getting better capital that is sweating our balance sheet, the loan to equity ratio, hybrid capital, portfolio guarantees, uh, global public goods funds, that kind of stuff, so that we can sweat our balance sheet without losing our AAA rating. If I can do these three things, a clear vision and mission, good partners with a number of people, including crowdsourcing private finance money, and get the right capital work going, I think then we get the right to go back and look for a bigger bank which is kind of what the N.K. Singh, Larry Summers so I'm coming to that in a moment because one of the things that India has tried to do in this G20 is to emerge as the voice of the Global South. And one of the things that the South is trying to do is to make these multilateral uh, institutes like the World Bank more egalitarian in the way they function, less dominated by the West. Now, you've, you've studied in India, you grew up in a Fauci family, so you understand the concerns of a country like India. How are you working towards that, that these Bretton Woods institutions actually become less Washington-dominated uh, and more open to uh, receiving the ideas of the Global South? So, first of all, I disagree completely with the Washington-dominated word. These institutions, the World Bank, 55% of the employees of the bank are outside of the U.S., they're in countries. The, India has a huge office. I was in Nigeria, in Ethiopia, in Peru, in Jamaica, the Pacific Islands, Timor-Leste, Indonesia last week. These are big offices with dedicated people. So I don't subscribe to the Washington dominance. I think what they're referring to is the shareholding pattern of one part of the bank in particular, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And I think that's because of voting power. You shouldn't allow that to divert from the ability of management to connect with countries. We do, with every country, a three-year country partnership framework every three years. It agrees with the country what the priorities for that country are. That's not done in DC. It's done in New Delhi. And it's done in Jakarta. And it's done in, you know, in Kenya and in Nairobi. So that's the first link. The second link is 
we put projects on the ground against those. These are very country-driven model. What we have globally are centers of expertise because the bank is both a source of financing, but even more, as India's government would tell you, is a source of knowledge. That knowledge bank has global practices with people based not only in D.C., but in India and other countries. That has the most centralized global feel, but the implementation, the strategic agreement with countries is all local. You know, while the World Bank's agenda is financial and economic, there's an element of geopolitics coming in as well, with China looking to set up its own parallel institutes uh, with the BRICS New Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, raising questions about how these will be uh, competing or comparing with the World Bank in trying to meet the financing needs of the Global South. Yes, yeah, so I think the world's challenges are very plentiful and the kind of financial effort and energy required are much more than any one institution can or should want to dominate on. This is not about domination or winning. This is about development. So I actually welcome Dilma at NDB and I welcome Jin at AIIB. We actually have partnerships with them. There's the Asian Development Bank. There's the Inter-American that I just told you about. The African Development Bank with Akeem. These are all very useful partners. I think the World Bank can partner with them and do things together. For example, we have what's called the Multilateral Insurance Guarantee Agency, which is a very specialized capability of providing insurance against political risk. Now, the other guys don't have it. Maybe they can use our vehicle to help do what they're doing. If at the end of the day, that improves the lot of women in Nigeria, what's wrong with that? So, you know, I have a slightly different view on this. This is not about winning. This is about getting the right is thing Is that done. just uh, Ajay Bangaji with his diplomatic pagri on saying this? Because there is one of the reasons why Washington is showing greater urgency about arranging more funds for the World Bank, frankly, is because China has been looking to make deep inroads. No, that's not true. That's what the press says. Mm -hmm. I think that's the conclusion drawn from geopolitics. I, when, I, when I got involved with the World Bank and I met President Biden, he was very clear when he understood the leverageability of the bank's resources. So let me give you a very simple math. If you get a dollar of capital into the bank and everybody else also puts in money to keep their shareholding, that leads to six or seven. The U.S. puts in one, you end up with six or seven in total in capital. You lever that five times on the balance sheet at a triple-A rating and you end up with $35 to lend in the world. You show me a government program of any country where one dollar becomes 35 and I'll give you a medal. So the president of the U.S. basically said to me, this is a great program. One becomes 35. I should back you every day of the week. And that's where he's coming from. So he said recently, he's put a couple of billion dollars into an appropriation budget bill that's gone to the Hill. If that works out well, that gives us $25 billion of lending capacity over a decade. This is pretty cool. So I think, yes, there is the geopolitics, and I don't deny it. But China is a shareholder of mine and a large shareholder. And I have an excellent working relationship with them. So as far as I'm concerned, there's work to do together. Now, China doesn't take much money from us any longer. They don't need it. But what we work together on is knowledge. So for example, what does China want to work on? Climate, healthcare. By the way, these the US needs, India needs, the European Union needs, and Africa needs. So I don't get the distinction between one and the other on such topics. Yes, there are areas where these countries don't agree. And I get that. That's up to them. But there's a lot of space for the bank to work on in climate and healthcare. That alone can keep us occupied for years to come.